Well, hello. I was going to start the, the yellow submarine, but I, I was probably as surprised as you were. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna, we're going to start the thank you for coming, first of all. Uh, Maddie would be very, very happy to see you all coming here and, and celebrate her life. And we're just going to, uh, I'd like to invite you right now, we're going to have two, one song right now. And uh, if you want to stand, if you want to sit, whichever you want to do, uh, I just want to invite you to sing it with me. We're going to sing uh, one of her favorite hymns. It was uh, Holy, Holy, Holy. I have never been muted. <laughs> John, who's coming up after me, can share those stories. There we go. You can hear me now. Thank you. So on behalf of the families, thanks for being here. And again, my reminder, I'm one of the pastors here. My name is Dan Wilvers. Um, I'm going to read for you Madeline's uh, life journey. I like that a lot better than obit. And... Um, I probably will add a couple of my own comments, but I'll make sure that you know they're my comments as we go along. Madeline May Kemp Grubbs, a beloved wife of 72 years. Let that one hang in the air for a second. Yes, <laughs> amazing. Mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother, she passed away peacefully on May 27th at, uh, at 2023 
at 93 years of age. She was born December 13th, 1929. Madeline and her mother were both born on Friday the 13th and has always considered it a blessing. As a young child, she lived with her parents and grandparents on a fruit farm in Pico Rivera, California, right off the 605, which didn't exist in those days. She loved to share stories of climbing trees, picking any fruit she wanted to eat, being spoiled by the farm workers, loving on the farm animals, and spending her days with extended family. She and her siblings, Stan and Sue, loved playing pranks on each other. The fam family later moved to Montebello, California, and for those of you unfamiliar with Southern California, this is me speaking, Pico Rivera is here, and Montebello is here, so a little north to the west, but if you had a really good arm, you could probably chuck a rock between the two of them, so. Not too far, right, Sue? And uh, that's where Madeline attended school and lived until she married. She learned to play the piano and loved to play all throughout her life. She was so proud when her grandchildren picked up the instrument and continued her legacy. No comment on gym and drums, however. So, <laughs> music played a big part throughout her life and she loved, as you could tell from the music we had on earlier, listening to records. Um, Debbie Reynolds, Doris Day, Frank Sinatra, and Perry Como. She even met Doris Day in person. She loved watching her kids perform in high school and attended all of her grandchildren's dance recitals and musical performances. Madeline was very active in Job's Daughters through high school, and she was very proud to be elected queen in her senior year. She loved organizing the dances. Madeline spent every Sunday at church with her family. Her grandmother was one of the founders of Park Avenue Christian Church in Montebello. One of Madeline's favorite memories was coming home from church and the house smelling of pot roast. I don't think that was just her family's memory either. <laughs> that her mom would put on the stove before they left. And she was very, very active in her church. And that carried through. This is me talking now. Um, up to the point when I got to meet her and Ray. I mean, you could just tell she was at home in the presence of the Lord and his people. She attended Bible studies, was in charge of children's church, and was very active with the youth group. There was a member of that church that started talking to Maddie about their son, Ray, who was in the armed services. Delma Grubb started matchmaking the two of them before they even met. And once they did meet, the rest, they say, is history. On July 26th, 1950, Madden, Madeline married the love of her life, Ray Grubbs, with whom she shared a lifelong commitment and devotion. And they continued their active church life in Park Avenue Christian Church. They were members of the Young Married Couples Group, and Maddie shared this story. At church, we were in a couples class and made friends for life. We did many things together with all of our families, but the adults would go out about once a month for an adult night out. We were the ones who joined the diners club. Uh, the adults wanted to learn how to play bridge, so Joe Potter taught us, and we were called the bridge group and would meet together once a month at one of our homes. We sort of lost interest because you had to think too much and couldn't talk, so instead, we just started playing stupid games like Monopoly. And I, I don't think Monopoly's stupid, but you know, kind of a brain game for me. <laughs> oh, heck, and spoons. This way, we could just play and talk a lot. We were always together for a big New Year's Eve party for over 40 years. You can just tell Maddie writing that with the enthusiasm she had for those times. Madeline talked Ray into going into teaching. They both attended. Whittier College earned their teaching credentials. Madeline taught until she became pregnant with the twins and then took off for a few years until her son Jim entered kindergarten. And she loved to share that both she and Jim started kindergarten together. She taught for over 30 years and she believed that being a teacher and doing the work and serving the children and families is one of the noblest things anyone 
can do. Together, Madeline and Ray raised three wonderful children, Deborah Grubbs Kushner, Cynthia Grubbs Elias, and James Grubbs. Madeline treasured the time spent with her family, whether they were sailing, golfing, camping, or traveling on cruises and road trips. This here is my favorite part of her life journey. She loved supporting her favorite sports teams, the USC college football team, fight on, Maddie, <laughs> and the LA Rams. As a devoted and loving mother, Madeline believed that raising her three children and grandchildren with godly wisdom and guidance was her greatest accomplishment. She also derived great satisfaction from her career as a teacher, impacting the lives of countless young minds. Madeline's sweet and positive personality, her humility in her achievements, and her unwavering faith in God have left an indelible legacy of love for her family, her friends, and all who knew her. And I am blessed to have known Maddie. I have one word for Maddie that jumps out when I think of her. Delightful. She was just the most delightful woman that I've had the opportunity to meet in my life. Always smiling, just always so gracious, um, such, such fond memories. I can't even imagine what it was to grow up with her. So, and Sue, I want to just say this before I conclude with Maddie's own words. Of all the people in this room, you knew her the longest. Of course, Ray knew her the best, but um, that's, that's something that you two had that long life together and both shared teaching. So just my own personal condolences to you and to you, Ray. Because just an amazing, amazing person. Isn't it wonderful? It doesn't end here. In Maddie's own words, happiness is a state of heart. We will have problems in our life and need, well, excuse me, this is a question. Will we have problems in our life and need help? Of course, she writes. King Solomon, the smartest man in the world, wrote, joy is medicine. And a glad heart makes a happy face. How can we have a glad heart and joy? God has given us help and the tools if we just ask and listen to what the Holy Spirit is letting you know. Two songs I remember when we would go to sing when I was young in the Bible school are, when you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. <laughs> and I have joy, 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 joy down in my heart today. God has given us happiness in our 72 years of marriage and living close to our loving children and their families. We have been blessed by him and thank him every day. May her memory, wisdom, and love continue to live on through her family and loved ones, and may she rest in eternal peace well, I can tell you, everything that was Maddie in this life that bore the resemblance of Christ lives on. And we will see her who know Christ again. Um, let me just say a quick prayer before we continue on with the service. Father, we are so blessed by people who have taken your message to heart and have lived it with such joy as Maddie did. And I can only... Just think that the sense of loss is, um, is huge. Because when someone is so blessed and has blessed so many, it's just, it's a big part missing. But our hope isn't in this life, Lord. It's in the life that comes after this, where there will be no more tears or sorrow or separation. And to that end, Lord, I would pray for the family and those that love Maddie, that as we hold on to faith in Christ, that we will know that reunion is not too far off. I pray all this in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Oh, I'm sorry. We have a video tribute.
looked like you guys had a very full life, full of a lot of fun. <laughs> um, I'll have to admit, I didn't recognize most of you until <laughs> the later pictures. It, it is kind of fun to look back on some of those times and remember, and I think that's really the point of things like this is to, I mean, we mourn the loss, obviously, but um, also remember the good times. I mean, there was a lot, of, a lot of good times to remember and reflect on and just thank God for. Um, I'm going to do something I've really never done before. Cindy and Debbie and Jim graciously loaned me Maddie's Bible. And you can really gain a lot of insight into a person's life um, and, and what was really important and significant to them. And her Bible really shows signs of being very well used. <laughs> um, I notice it's covered with underlinings and verses that are circled and highlighted. Uh, sometimes there's stars by them. Don't miss this. And when looking through her Bible, it was really easy to, to see what was at the core of her being. Um, family was very, very important to her but her relationship with Jesus superseded that even. Now, do you know what else I found in her Bible? Some of you know. I found some pencils. <laughs> and I found a box of Altoids. <laughs> and a bunch of tissues. Lots of pencils, too. And tissues. Um, she was ready for just about anything. And um, what I found interesting, though, is that she didn't use the tissues for the sniffles. I mean, that's probably there, too. But she, she tore them down into little strips that she used for bookmarks. Look at that. I mean, it's full. It was tough trying to decide what to look at and not. I mean, it was amazing. Um, and um, I think what she would really hope for us being here today, thinking about her, remembering her life, is that we would embrace the scriptures and the God that they reveal the way she did. Um, I, I wish we had time to scan through her whole Bible. Uh, if we did, it would probably be one of the best sermons you'll hear, ever hear. Um, uh, but I'll share two passages that really stood out to me in this. One of those was Psalm 139. And at the very heading of the psalm, beginning of the psalm, she writes this note, the greatest fear is being known. And that's an interesting entry since um, the psalmist notes in verses 1 through 6 that nothing is hidden from God. He knows our deepest secrets, our fears, and our longings. And he says in verse 1, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me not just casually, but deeply in, into the most intimate parts of who I am. You know when I sit down. You know when I rise up. You even perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in, uh, you hem me in behind and before and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. And it's kind of scary to be known that thoroughly and that deeply. Maddie seemed to be very mindful of the fact that nothing is hidden from God, even our thoughts and the words we speak before we even say them. No wonder she wrote, the greatest fear is being known at the beginning of that psalm. But not only does God uh, know us ultimately and thoroughly, he is also unavoidable. We can't hide from him. And the psalmist says in verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for the darkness is as light to you. 
Reminds me of Genesis chapter 3. After Adam disobeyed God, he tried to hide, and he found out that's a lost cause. Uh, it was unable un 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 to hide from God. It really is scary when you think about it. God knows the very thoughts that go through our mind, the words before we even speak them, and there's nowhere to hide from him. And then she wrote another note by verses 13 through 18, which I thought was really interesting. She wrote, how I matter to God. In verse 13, the psalmist writes, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. That's a poetic way of saying when, when she was formed when in, inside his, mother, his mother's womb. And he says, your, your eyes saw my unformed body. Talk about no place to hide. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I am awake, I am still with you. Now, like I said before, her family, and you see from the videos, the, uh, mattered a lot to Maddie. But I think she would want you to know that you matter even more to God than you ever could to her. Her fear was gone also because she knew how much she mattered to God. And no matter what, he was not going to leave her or forsake her. And then in verses 19 through 22, the psalmist expresses his loyalty to God and his opposition to all who would dishonor him. He says, away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. And at first glance, that seems somewhat out of place until you get to the last two verses, verses 23 and 24. Now, remember what she wrote at the beginning of the psalm, the greatest fear is being known. But she underlined and circled psalm to, uh, the verses 23 and 24, which says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. She was totally open to God's scrutiny. Not only did she acknowledge that it was a scary thing, but I think those two verses were like a prayer to her, to God for her, that he would reveal to her anything that would lead her to rebel against him, like the psalmist is saying in verses 19 to 22. And I think she demonstrated a very deep trust in the goodness and grace of God by opening herself up to his scrutiny. Now, there was another passage that stood out to me because it had one of these bookmarks in it. <laughs> I love that. Uh, First Peter. Now, I, I thought, uh, I didn't think anyone had First Peter chapter 1 marked up any more than me, but when I opened this tissue bookmark to First Peter 1, I think she had me beat. And I want to read it to you, at least the first nine verses. I mean, this is so marked up. There's circles, there's underlines, there's stars, there's notes. I mean, this was very meaningful to her. And she says, well, actually, at the beginning of it, she says, uh, basically, this is to encourage us to hold on tight to the truth from God. Don't let go. And uh, it reads there, uh, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the God's elect, strangers in the world, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through the sanctifying work of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and sprinkling by his blood, grace and peace to you. And, and she notes there that this is our calling. It's, the, it's a divine calling. It's God calling for us. It was his idea, our salvation was his idea from the very beginning. Uh, it's not something that we invented. 
And then in verses three through five, she, she wrote above that, this is our inheritance. Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, circle, circle, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And then verse four was circled in a lot of underlines on it. And into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be re revealed in the last time. That was really her confidence that she had an inheritance that was not on this world. It wasn't subject to markets, crashes, or anything else. It wasn't going to be lost. And in fact, not only was it subject to the, the, the ups and downs of this world, it was being shielded by God's power, Peter writes here. And then, do you think we'll have struggles? She said, yeah, your struggles, verses 6 through 8. In this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Star, circle, <laughs> these have come. Now, this is a very important verse to her. These trials of all kinds have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though it's refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do now, now see him, now you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, one of the things that I think was really, she was highlighting here was the key word, um, the words faith. And uh, it was circled, underlined, stars beside it several times in that passage. And there's a lot of misunderstanding, I think, in our culture surrounding the words believe and faith. And so um, in his book, Cold Case Christianity, former homicide detective J. Warner Wallace describes a situation that I think really describes what the Bible means by faith, probably better than anything I've ever read. So he writes this, I got the call about 1 a.m., Detectives who are assigned to the homicide unit also investigate officer-involved shootings, and all of us on the officer-involved shooting team were called out for this one. When I arrived at the scene, Officer Mark Walker was standing by his patrol car talking with the sergeant and waiting for our arrival. I shook his hand, made sure he was ready to talk about the shooting, and began to walk through the events that precipitated our call-out. Mark told me that he was, working, he was working patrol when he saw a man driving down the suite, swerving from lane to lane as though he was drunk. He pulled the driver over and approached his car. When he leaned in to talk to the man, he could smell alcohol in his breath. Mark asked the man to step out of the car, and the driver reluctantly complied. As the man stood outside his car, Mark could see that he was angry and defiant, so he decided to uh, conduct a quick pack down search to make sure the irritated driver wasn't carrying any weapons. Mark had no idea that the driver was Jacob Stevens, a parolee with a long arrest record who had just been released from prison. He was on parole for an assault charge and tonight he was carrying a loaded 45 caliber pistol hidden in his waistband. Jacob knew that he would go back to jail if the gun was discovered and he was determined to stay out of jail. When Mark asked Stevens to turn around so he could conduct, conduct the pat down, Jacob turned away for a moment, pulled his gun, and then turned back toward Mark, pointing the gun at his chest. I knew he had the drop on me, Mark told me as he recalled the events. His gun was already drawn and pointed at me and I, before I could even get my hand on mine. Jacob had already decided he wasn't going back to prison even if it meant killing this police officer. Jacob pointed his gun at Mark and started to squeeze the trigger. Mark was about to enter the fight of his life and he was starting off with a distinct disadvantage. He was already seconds behind his opponent. Now all of us who work law enforcement understand the importance of wearing our bulletproof vests. When we first became officers, we were trained with these vests. We knew that they could stop a bullet. On this night, Mark was going to put his best to the test. 
Now listen to this. I just tensed my stomach muscles and prepared to take the shot as I pulled the gun, my gun out of my holster. I knew he was going to get the first round off. Now, this is really important. While Mark knew that his vest could sustain the impact of a bullet, tonight he trusted in the vest for the very first time. In that singular moment, Mark went from belief that to belief in. It's one thing to believe that the vest can save a life. It's another thing to trust it to save your life. That's the difference between what I would call casual assent and committed trust. And I want to ask you a question. In light of what we learned about Maddie's trust in Christ, will you give some thought to this question? Is your faith a casual assent about Jesus or is it committed trust? In, in other words, have you turned away from your old way of life to a new life of trusting and following and obeying Jesus? Not just on Christmas and Easter and an occasional Sunday, but for the entirety of your life. That's why Jesus died, was buried, and rose again to give you and me a whole new kind of life. Now, there's one more passage that jumped out at me. There was a lot of them, but this one really, really struck me after going through her Bible a few times and really trying to get into her head and her heart. It was Psalm 4, verse 8, and it says, I will lie down and sleep in peace, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. I will lie down and sleep in peace, for you, O Lord, make me dwell in safely, safety. Maddie was ready for the inevitable, the existence of her frail body. She did not fear death. I think she might have even welcomed it because she was ready to meet her Savior face to face. Her faith wasn't just belief that, it was solidly belief in God's love for her and his promise to make her dwell in safety. That was her confidence. That was her life. Now, we, we call this memorial a celebration of Maddie's life. And, and it really is. We want to remember. We want to enjoy and celebrate uh, the things that we, that we experience with her. But if you really want to celebrate her life, follow in her footsteps and embrace a lifestyle of trust and obedience to Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I pray. Uh, it, it's just been such a blessing to look through the things that really stood out to Maddie in her Bible, things that uh, you must have been putting on her mind and her heart. Um, I, I pray that as we think about these things, that we would emulate her example of trust and obedience to you. And like Maddie, may we have the courage to open ourselves to you so that we might discover anything that might be offensive to you and that we would turn from it. So thank you for this reminder, this remarkable woman and her life of faith and devotion to you as well as devotion to her family. And Lord, uh, before we quit here, I, I just want to thank you for all the people that... Uh, just so lavishly turned out to provide a meal for us. And I pray that our fellowship over this meal would really be a time of blessing and remembering and celebrating the life and faith of Maddie Grubbs. Amen. Right, if you want to please stand with me and uh, send, sing this song. This uh, also talks about the faithfulness of God and uh, just in view of what we just heard, I think it's, uh, it's very appropriate. I'd love to oh, invite you to sing it with me. Great is thy faithfulness O oh, God my Father There is with thee Thou changes not, thy compassions they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Summer and winter, 
in springtime in her best sun moon and stars in their courses above join with all nature in man have full witness to thy great faithfulness mercy like to invite you now. We're going to be having some refreshments in the back, some uh, food and uh, more yellow submarine. <laughs> and uh, if you want to join us back there, I'd love to. Um, have a, thank you for coming. <laughs> 